I am so happy to be joined again by Kimberly West, who, as a young woman, was diagnosed with severe ulcerative colitis, inflammatory joint disease, chronic anemia, and has survived through seizures and temporary loss of vision. Last week, she talked about her life-altering hidden disability and how she's found joy in her suffering. Today, she is back to share how God is using her to minister to those around her, whether she's bedbound, housebound, or hospital bound. Kim, I'm so happy to be speaking with you on the podcast again today, especially because you are an audio visual display of God's grace and power through ongoing hardships. So for our listeners who may have missed last week's episode, can you bring us up to speed and share a little bit of your story again? Sure. So in 2012, I was diagnosed with not one, but several autoimmune diseases, and I've undergone now 20 surgeries and had nine different organs removed, and I'm still in the process of dealing with some pretty major health issues, but regardless of my circumstances, I've chosen to have my main focus be on the Lord and finding the joy in suffering. Believe it or not, it's probably been the best eight years of my life, despite the hardships that I've endured. Well, and that's why I love talking to you because although you faced so many challenges, your focus is really on the Lord and what he's doing in and through your hardships. So today I thought we'd begin this conversation by hearing more about how your physical challenges impacted your relationships. How does it make you feel when people ask you questions about your health? I mean, how open were you initially after you got sick And was it hard to share with your friends about all that was going on with your body? Yeah. So I would say initially it was a very hard topic just because of the different body parts that it involved. I think for any single female, especially when you're dealing with guy friends or older males at church that want to pray for you and know specifics or those type of things, it can be a bit awkward But this is where I felt my relationship with God really changing because I felt him telling me, number one, that I just needed to be extremely transparent with what was going on with me, but I also really needed help. And so I felt him asking me to be vulnerable. One of the ways that I have always done both of these things with myself was just through writing. I've always enjoyed writing and I've always enjoyed journaling. It's something that I've done since I was young. So I chose to start a blog and it was very early on in my journey. And I made the blog for family and friends originally. I had a email list. I was completely honest and vulnerable with everything in my life. Those who wanted to read could, and those who didn't, didn't have to. But this way, everybody knew what was going on, and I didn't have to say it out loud, but they could read it, and it was kind of more of a humbling way, I guess you could say, of sharing everything. And this allowed me to have that freedom and kind of escape. But at the same time, the second I did it, God just showed me how he was using this to transform my life. I mean, almost immediately, the amount of love and support that I got and encouragement that I got was just overwhelming. That blog is still going today, which is now public, and it has reached over 60 countries. And the amount of things that have come out of that blog are literally overwhelming and mind-blowing. So, It has been one of the most incredible things that has ever happened in my life. Yeah, Kim, I've loved reading your blog. You are truly transparent there. So what's the name of your blog so that our listeners can go and see your smiling face and see pictures of you and learn more about your story? Um, It's Kim's Cause. That's K-I-M-S-K-A-U-S-E dot WordPress dot com. Perfect. And we'll have that link also on our podcast page. So you can visit johnnyandfriends.org slash podcast. One of the things that you mentioned is vulnerability. Even when I think about our last conversation, you were talking about how there was a huge shift from a focus on image 
And especially as a woman who valued image and got her hair done and her nails done to the point where you had an ostomy bag, kind of like you were describing it where you were ashamed and embarrassed of it, but then you got to a point where you really embraced it and you said it was actually a part of you. How did you get to that point of even thinking, okay, this is always going to be a part of me. How did you find contentment in that? It took a little while. It definitely took a while. I like to joke and say my Chanel bag turned into my ostomy bag. Um, <laughs> I think it, well, for one, it is a part of me. And mm-hmm. I had to learn that I needed to accept it and love who I am as a person. And in order to love me, I had to love all of me, not just parts of me. And, you know, there's that saying that a scar is a reminder of where you've been or a mark of who you are. And the ostomy bag is that life-saving grace that is there. If I didn't have that surgery in the beginning, I may not be here today. And if I didn't continue to have surgery after surgery, I may not be here today. And when I look at that bag, I don't just look at the bag. I look at all the people behind the bag and all the people that have supported me and loved me and all of the doctors who have put in the work to help me. And it's a symbol of love for me. It's a symbol of grace from God. And it's a symbol of so many wonderful things instead of so many gross and shameful things. The blessings outweigh the hardships. So I can't really complain about it anymore. It's just a natural part of my day and it's become part of the routine. And if one day is harder than the next, I just kind of roll with it. So I just had to continue to be positive about it and train myself to look at it the way that I do now. Mm. Well, that's huge. And I think anytime we look at the hardships that we faced and we see how God's hand is moving in it, There's an opportunity for thankfulness and blessing. But I think something you said, even about your blog, that your transparency is actually what's caused people to pour out their love and compassion and support of you. And I think that's something maybe we are deceived to think that the more honest we are about our situations, the more we'll drive people away. But It's really vulnerability and a sense of being kind of weak in front of others that can knit heartstrings together and create friendships. And that's certainly what it's been for you. So I'm interested to know, how is your social life and involvement with friends and family and even serving in the church, how has that changed for you through the years? Well, I would definitely say that who I am as a person has changed. I'm obviously extremely more vocal about my devotion to the Lord and my love for God. Mm. He's in everything that I do. I shout it from the rooftops. <laughs> so um, <laughs> my friends know that part of me. And it's been a huge blessing, actually, because I have friends who identify as atheists. I have friends who are not religious. Mm. So I have gotten to have these opportunities with so many people to still be, you know, some sort of light in this world that is so dark, especially during this time. And it's been pretty incredible. I think that my consistency in how I have continued to live my life, it's been, I think, impactful for my friendships. My friends that were meant to be my friends are still here. I lost a lot of friends when I got sick. That definitely happened. And Why it was, was that? Why do you think that happened? It was very hard. My two closest friends are not in my life anymore, and that was devastating for me. In some cases, people don't know how to deal with being around someone who's sick. Mm-hmm. In other cases, I think because you're not able to maybe attend things and go to things or they don't understand constantly having to change or cancel plans or they just can't deal with the fact that you're not available anymore. Like I said, I was a very fast paced, always on the go. I was the person that was at every event. So when you go from that to not being able to attend anything or the only way you can see them is if you come and visit them and they're, you know, sitting on a couch, it's not the same kind of friendship anymore. Mm -hmm. 
So that's it painful. was a very big eye opener for me. And that's why I say God definitely put the right people in my life during this time. And he took the people out that weren't supposed to be there. It was hard, but he also brought some amazing people in. Mm. Well, and from what I understand, Kim, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're largely homebound. I mean, you said, you know, your friends would come over and spend time with you on the couch. You're no longer going out to events and maybe you don't have the same type of things in common that you used to with people. So I'm thinking about impact. How does one have an impact when they're largely homebound and even bed bound? How do you, how do you view friendships and fellowships and serving now that you're largely at home and how can someone have relationships and serve the Lord when they can't leave their house? I think you've done this beautifully. Can you talk more about that? I would say as far as that goes, it's varied for me. There's been different points during the last eight years where I was definitely homebound and bed bound in between surgeries. I can go out to dinner or I can attend church or do things, but I wouldn't say that I'm going to go hike in the mountains or go on a lavish vacation or something like that. You know Um, your limits. Yes, exactly. The main thing that I have found is, you know, doing my blog, I've basically called myself kind of like a missionary from bed. I've been able to reach, you know, quite a few people. So that's been one of my biggest things that I've chosen to do is Mm. spread the gospel from bed. And through that, as I mentioned before, the impact that it's had, people have written me from everywhere. So I have been able to make contact with quite a few people and form friendships with people from different parts of the world. Some people who have the same kind of illnesses with me, Mm. we've been able to be support for each other through social media. I've been able to connect with other people and been able to be an ear for others as well. Mm. One thing that you find when you happen to have illnesses or be sick is that people gravitate towards you. Mm. And so... I am a very empathetic person to begin with, but I think you have a different kind of appreciation for it once you become sick. People gravitate towards you to tell you their problems, and people gravitate towards you to tell you what's wrong with them because I feel like they think it's a safe place or that you can relate to them. Mm -hmm. One of the problems I had early on was so many people gravitated towards me that it was overwhelming for me. And it was hard for me because I am such an empathetic person and a people pleaser that I wanted to help everybody, but I was exhausting myself Mm -hmm. and worrying about everyone else. And so I had to learn a balance of where it was good to work with others and where it was okay to say, I'm signing off now, because it became almost like I was consumed with everyone on the internet rather than, you know, helping myself. But I've I've turned it into a blessing. I am definitely there for others and I'm definitely there for phone calls. And I check in on so many people all the time. I kind of have like a list that I go through and I make sure that I see how people are doing when I say I'm going to pray for you. It's not one of those, oh, I'll pray for you. Like your name's written down in my prayer journal and I'm going to pray for you. So I make sure that, you know, I continue with those things. The less fortunate have always been on my heart as well. So I kind of started a little bit of a ministry with serving the homeless on my way to doctor appointments. So I started collecting old backpacks and I would get toiletry kits and blankets and people that were giving away like sleeping bags or whatnot. And when I go down to LA for my doctor appointments, there's, so many people down there. So we would hand backpacks out the windows to people on the street that's filled with a meal and clothing and sunscreen and those kind of things. So that's been one way that I've served for the last few years. You're really taking the initiative and making a plan about what you're going to do. And I think that seems to me, speak into this because this is your life, but that is a way to ward off discouragement and depression because I think, you know, when we encounter various trials, I think we can experience a sense of purposelessness. Why am I here? What am I doing? How am I serving the Lord? 
But it sounds like you've used this as a platform to build relationships, to use your spiritual gift, to create a community where you're not just meeting emotional needs, but you're really turning people to the Lord. I did go through a little bit of this, but I feel like Satan wants to isolate us. And I feel like Mm -hmm. when we are weak, he creeps in and he just takes a little inch at a time, but he wants us to feel like we are alone and he wants to tell us that you shouldn't talk about what's going on with you and you should be ashamed of this and you should feel bad because you have this and you should feel bad because you don't look like this. And, you know, he tells you all these lies. He just feeds you and feeds you and feeds you. But the worst thing that you can possibly do is isolate yourself because once you've done that, then there is no escape out of there. You just sit in that and you just listen to these lies that feed and fear around you. That grab hold can be so tight Mm -hmm. and so suffocating that that's where you can get lost. And so I feel like if you don't even give him that little bit of an inch, he's not going to get that mile on you. So I feel it's so important. And I do this all the time. I wake up in the morning and I'm like, oh, my legs hurt so bad. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, nope, nope, God, this is going to be a good day. We're going to get through this. Like I got through yesterday. I can get through today. Like you can't even give that little bit of complaint because he's going to grab onto it and he's just going to sail. Mm. So I think for everybody, the most important thing you can do is socialize, whether it's through the phone, whether it's somebody on social media, whether it's calling, emailing, whatever it is, do not be alone. That's good. That is so right. Well, support from family, friends, and brothers and sisters in Christ is imperative. And so for those who are facing life-altering health issues who feel isolated, and they probably feel like people don't understand, what's been most helpful to you in terms of encouragement and meeting your needs? And what's been like hurtful or not so helpful from those who have tried to reach out to you. What to do, what not to do, what to say, what not to say. Teach us, Kim. Most people definitely come from a loving, helpful place. So I think that's what you have to keep in mind always. They mean well, right? Yes. So I think like so many people get so frustrated and I hear this all the time, like stop saying that or like, why did they say that or the 10 top things not to say to people? And I think what you have to keep in mind is that this person cares about you or they wouldn't even be asking or they wouldn't even come up to speak to you in the beginning. So that you always have to keep that in the back of your mind when this person is talking to you. And also they may not know the right thing to say to you. Our normal response, and I am most guilty of this is I'm fine. I'm good. It's okay. So they have nothing to work with when you give them a response to, oh, you don't even look sick, or I didn't know you were sick, or, oh, you know, I have this too, or trying to relate to you, or trying to fix the issue. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a two-way street when it comes to that. If you're not willing to be transparent and share with them what is really going on, then how are they able to ask you the proper question or to know what's going on with you? Mm -hmm. So I think the right thing to do is if somebody does say something that you may not really care for, just kindly explain to them, you know, I may not look sick, but I'm really going through something right now. So if you could pray for me, that would be awesome. That's that vulnerability again. Yeah. And I I think that's one of my favorite words. And I think that's where God like softened my heart in so many ways, because if you're not honest and if you're not vulnerable, you're not going to get many places. Mm -hmm. But if you are, it's incredible how many places it will take you. Mm. Something as simple as paying a bill off. A lot of people will just run away from the bill because they don't have the money to pay for it. So they'll just blow it off and be like, well, what are they going to do? Come after me? They'll send it to a collector. So, oh, well, and be done with it. Mm. Where if you're honest and you tell them, they may possibly work something out with you. Mm. They may possibly lower it. They may possibly do something, you know, you never know, but if you're not honest and not upfront, nothing's going to happen regardless. Mm -hmm. So my surgeon, I had a huge bill with him, humongous. And 
for the longest time, all I could afford to do was pay $100 a month. Now, at that rate, this bill wouldn't be paid off until I'm 100-something years old. Goodness. But I paid $100 every single month. And every month I wrote a little card with it and said hi to the lady in the billing department. It's a small office and, you know, wrote thank you and a smiley face and sent it to her. Well, <laughs> about a year ago, she sent me something and said, we're going to take off $35,000 if you could pay this oh, amount by this word. date. So I put that out there to the community that, like, this is incredible. This is happening. Like, I can't believe this. And, you know, it was paid. Now, it took longer than the time she gave me, but they graced me with that, too. So I was able to pay this off. Now, the last portion of it was paid by my church. And when they talked to the billing woman, she said, I got to tell you, that Kim paid a hundred dollars every single month. We've You're never faithful. had anybody. She said the honesty and the consistency in her, we've never had that. And so for me, I just thought that was a normal thing. So I just absolutely would that encourage was so different. people to be completely again honest and transparent because the things that can come from it mm. are incredible. Like I never would have thought something like that could have happened. I thought that I would have that debt until the day that I died. What a sweet so gift from I the just, Lord. And a lot of people never get to see what he's doing behind the scenes. Mm. And I've been so blessed to get to see so many of those kind of things pan out. And I truly believe it's because I continue to be faithful and continue to obey what he's asking me to do. That's right. That's right. God gives grace to the humble. And I think there's this, I mean, I've heard this from parents trying to teach their children. There's like the circle of obedience. There's a circle of blessing that you can stay in when you follow the Lord. And when you do what he's asked you to do, God will bless you in ways that you never expected were you to do your own thing or go your own way or rely on your own understanding. So... That's cool. I did not even think, you know, it's like a little card or those kindnesses can go a long way. And Kim, it seems like you really ground yourself in God's word and his promises. And I think that is especially transformative to your own soul when feelings of hopelessness try to take over. So what are some of the most powerful truths those scriptures or characteristics about God that you go back to time and time again that have given you strength and security in the face of even what you described as the lies that sometimes cause you to feel distant from God's love? Well, I definitely love the Beatitudes. I read Matthew 6 all the time. Probably my favorite is the one about care and anxiety. I think it's Matthew six twenty five. And I love Psalm 145, and I love especially the part that tells you that your kingdom is everlasting and that the eyes of all look to you and give them their food at the proper time, because I truly believe that God's timing is perfect. But I think for everything that you say negative, the Bible can give you a positive and so I think it's super important when you're saying that you feel life's not fair, you can go to for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an internal glory that far outweighs them all in Second mm-hmm. Corinthians. Or when you feel alone, you can go to do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand in Isaiah 41 mm-hmm. for do not trust anyone versus trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not only on your understanding in Proverbs. There's literally for everything that you say no to, there's a yes in the Bible. He is so good and so gracious. There is no end to it. Mm -hmm. There's no fear, no doubt, no worry if you just go to his word. Amen. And, And that verse from Matthew 6 that you talked about, that's the one where he says, If I care for the birds and the flowers, how much more am I going to care for you? And you've really seen that in your own life with God's abundant provision. You know, what are some of the most valuable things 
you'd want others to understand about those with ongoing health challenges? I know you can't speak for everybody, but for those who face chronic illness, many feel sidelined by their disability and often feel that others don't understand. So for those of us who haven't experienced that kind of hardship, what would you want us to know? What would you want the church to know? I think that even though you can't always see what's going on with somebody because their disabilities can be invisible, that it's real. Even though somebody may not look sick, that they are definitely suffering. We try to pull things together as well as we can. And if we show up, that means that we care. And if we show up, that means that what we're there for is extremely important to us. So being there is an effort. And I mentioned, I think in the last podcast that we talked about, being sick is a full-time job. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, well, what do you do all day? And I don't think people really understand that getting up and moving and showering can sometimes take all of the energy out of you to where you have to get back in bed just to rest Mm -hmm. physically from that. Mm -hmm. So when you see somebody showing up for you, know that means they love you. Know that means that they care for you and that they want to be there. I think it's important to also understand that if somebody commits to something and has to back out of something, that they're not doing it because they're lazy or they're not doing it because they don't want to do it. It's a, you know, real thing. And just to have patience and understanding for that person and also to continuously check on that person, even if they don't respond, keep sending a card, keep sending a text, keep sending an email, because regardless of how that person may be feeling at that moment, they're going to know that you still care. They're going to know that you're still thinking about them. And that could be the saving grace in their moment of weakness. That could be their saving grace in their moment of despair. So I think regardless of their response to you, it's important that you continue to reach out to them because one day they will grab that hand and they will respond back. Grace upon grace, kindness upon kindness. That is some practical wisdom. And for those who are listening today who feel isolated and even purposeless because of a disabling condition, hardship that continues to hang on. Kim, can you close our time together by sharing some words of wisdom and encouragement for weary hearts? One of my favorite verses is from Hosea. It's 2.15 and it says, God is the only one who can make the valley of trouble a door of hope. And I truly believe that God is the only one that can change our hearts, that can change our lives, that can change our outlook on everything. And that regardless of our circumstances, he's never going to forsake us. He's never going to leave us. That he bore the weight of the world for us. That word eternal. I mean, there's really no concept of how to define this, something that has no end. I mean, how do you wrap your head around that concept? I can only think of one word, and that would be love. And to understand that concept, that love has no limit that it goes on forever, that somebody could love you eternally is mind-blowing. So to understand that God is the definition of that, you're never alone. You can't be alone because God has eternal love for you and made the ultimate sacrifice for you. So I would just encourage you to meditate in those words, encourage you to meditate in his word, encourage you to never give up hope because hope is endless when you have God and life is so enjoyable with God, regardless of what your circumstances are. This is temporary. It's so, so temporary. And because he took the weight of the world on for us, We don't even know the extent of what pain is because he already took that for us. So just hang on because what you're going to experience in the end is going to be so incredible. It's so worth it. Kim, that's beautiful. And I love that verse you shared in Hosea that the pathwork of challenges is the doorway to hope. And I know you're walking through that doorway. Kim, it's been such a pleasure to speak with you again. You've been such an encouragement to me and I know our listeners 
We wish you God's continued favor and blessing upon your life. Thanks for your time today. What great advice for those in the midst of a chronic condition and those looking to deepen their compassion for those with hidden disabilities. Vulnerability can create an open door for deepening relationships with other people and seeing God's hand through your hardship. If you're in need of prayer or encouragement today, please send me a message at podcast at johnnyandfriends.org. I would love to hear from you and share an encouraging resource. You can also find all the resources that we've mentioned on the show at johnnyandfriends.org slash podcast. I'm Crystal Keating, and thank you for listening to the Johnny and Friends Ministry Podcast.